everyone, and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles podcast, a podcast for players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and it's great as always to be here with you. And then I have with me, as always, one of Adelaide South Australia's finest sons, Paul Bindig. How are you, Paul? I'm fantastic. Thank you, David. And once again, it's a pleasure to be in your esteemed company. And have you got a key to the city yet from the mayor? No, the mayor's been not returning my calls. But we'll, we'll look into that because surely it's due to arrive any day now. That's right. Um, so, yeah, excellent to be here. This is uh, one of our um, extra episodes of the podcast, and we're doing something a little bit different. Um, this time, we've put together a panel discussion on the state of the music business. So there's a nice, concise question. Um, we obviously all have our own experiences on the business side of the industry that we work in, uh, whether we're a weekend warrior or a professional musician. Um, and so, I mean, Paul and I definitely fill out the equation of the weekend warriors, but our two guests are both very much professional musicians. So um, Glenn Reiter is a keyboard and sax player for the iconic Australian fit uh, outfit Ice House. He also plays regularly with John Stevens, um, who Australians will know very well. Um, and John also played a role temporarily within Excess, so he's sort of known internationally as well. Um, and um, re, you know, Glenn has been on the show with us before, so um, to talk about you know his career in keyboards, and he also plays sax, the talented bugger. So it's great to have him back in this more panel discussion context. And then Paul Gilday is our notable second guest for the show. So, and he's here for three reasons. Uh, so first, like Glenn, he's a member of um, Ice House, um, joining them in 1990. So he's played with them for a long while. Um, so that's one reason we've had him on. Second is Paul is the very first specialist guitarist we've had on the show. So he's the first violation of the inner sanctum. Although as you'll hear, he actually does play a little bit of keyboards. Um, and then third, the reason we've allowed, um, you know, such a violation of a specialist guitar player is because, A, Paul's a great musician and guy, as you'll hear, um, and he's actually got really extensive experience teaching and coordinating arts management and music industry courses at both the Australian Institute of uh, Music and Box Hill Institute. And again, you'll hear a lot more about that. So we're very excited to have Paul join Glenn and then Paul on our side and I, for what we hope will be an interesting discussion. Enjoy. Um, Paul and Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. And for the sake of our viewers and listeners, or more our viewers, because our listeners won't care whether you're on the left or right. On the left, we have Mr. Paul Gilday. And on the right, we have Mr. Glenn Reiter. Thank you both for joining us. Um, regular uh, listeners and viewers will know Glenn has been on the show before. Uh, and Paul, we're really, really excited to have here as well. And so this is a bit of an extra episode to talk about the, the music business. Um, so I thought we'd start with something fun because uh, how long have you two actually been playing together? And um, most importantly, why do you still like each other? <laughs> no one said we did. Um, <laughs> a lot, I think so we lived in the same, virtually the same street, maybe 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And Glenn got me into a play on some of his demos. I think that's where it might have mm -hmm. started, mate. We knew each other from clubs and gigs, et cetera, et cetera, but we hadn't necessarily played in bands together. And then we both ended up in the Little River Band, American Little River Band together. And um, I did that only for a couple of months, stayed forever. He was there for seven years? Or uh, I was there for five years. Okay. But um, Paul actually got me into that. And then um, I came back and Ice House went back out on the road and I've been, doing, I've been doing that for 33 years. And, and, and then Glenn came and joined that band. And Paul got me into that one as well. So... <laughs> So two of the sort of, I suppose, like the bit longest sort of stint things that I've done has been because Paul called up and said, oh, you know, putting you forward for this, come into an audition, whatever, and, you know. Yeah. So, Paul, did Glenn have something over you or you just were, were um, oh, amazed he's, by his talent? He's got some photos. Got some the, stuff. From the early 80s. Got so some photos that, from Red Boy Casino. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Some, some really dodgy shit yeah. going on. Anyway. it's <laughs> excellent. Um so, Glenn, I thought we'd start um, off with you. So I know you do juggle a few roles to maintain a career in music. Um, so what, what's your take on the reality of actually being a professional muso nowadays? How, how do you make it work? Yeah, um, I'm very lucky that I'm working with uh, an artist who wants to work a lot and is capable of working a lot. So... Um, like a normal year for us would be, you know, 100, 120 shows. So that's kind of, that takes care of my year pretty much. 
Um, and then in the in-between bits, I've done... Uh, there's so many. I, I sometimes go give um, chats to to high school music classes about like about all the different ways that people you know don't realise that you can make money in the music business. Um, and one of the things I talk to them about is making money while you sleep. So so if you can do something that's that um, has a royalty stream to it or is generating fees for you overnight, then that's a really good thing. So one of the things I do is um, stock music. I do um, library music. Library music, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but Paul knows a lot about other a lot of other streams. I've got to say too, um, the, there's a keyboard chronicles uh, thing. Paul actually does have bona fides. He's a, a, a fantastic guitarist, but he has actually played keyboards with Ice House as well. So, uh, because he uh, broke his wrist, was it? He broke. How did you do that again? I fell over. He right. fell over. He had a nasty fall. He had an old man's uh, yeah, fall. Senior moment. Senior moment. And broke his wrist. Yeah. And um, A week before the tour. week before the tour. So I actually had to program a whole lot of one-finger chords for him to play. And they would just go chromatically up the keyboard. So he hit this one at the start of the verse and then go up to the C-sharp, then the D, then the D, and, and, and until we get to the end of the song sort I've, of thing. I've still got the Ice House on. I had a, it oh, it. It's the ice house sling. It's the sling that I used to wear on stage. I, I don't know if I can. Anyway, you don't. You don't need. Oh, to that's know. Cool. I thought it was a bib there for a minute. So I'm yeah, pleased it's a sling. It, it yeah. will be the ice house sling. So he's not. Um, he's not out here under false pretenses. He's a keyboard player of some repute. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. How, how many keyboard players are in that band? Yeah. There's, yeah. There's two. There's, there's, two. Always, there's always been two. But um, I think at that time when you did that, well. Uh, Michael Painter went down the front Correct. to take over your guitar yeah, yeah, gig yeah. down the yeah. front. Yep. So and you came up and st stood up there and played the one finger chords. Yes, for us. I don't really brilliantly. Brilliantly, yeah. He's, yeah. 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 So, so does that mean that, that playing keyboards is easier than playing guitar because you only need one hand to do it? Would that would that be right? Well, yeah, it's, that was my experience. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So if, if we, just, just following on the, the, I guess, the music industry uh, question, if, if we compare it to, say, the 1970s and the 1980s, and, and maybe st starting with, with you, Paul, but then also I'd love your thoughts as well, Glenn, how do you think things have changed? Have they changed much in, in your experience of what it takes to make a living out of the industry? I think there's two massive changes. One, we're lucky that we're both in sort of heritage style acts that, that, that can play, although Ivor doesn't like to play a lot. So I, I, we will do a maximum of about 25 shows this year. But they'll all be big. We'll spend four days in Uluru. We've just, we, we're in Darwin for four days. And mm -hmm. um, we've, got, we've got a corporate gig tomorrow night. And, and, but we're up in Sydney for a couple of days for that. Um, I went to teaching a while back. If I, okay, so if I do a comparison back to the 70s, yeah, I was in bands like I was in James Rain's band for five years and that was six nights a week. And then when we were in LRB, that was six nights a week for six months of the year in the United States. Um, and uh, and other people that I've played with has been in a similar circumstance. I think there's two massive changes. People have to portfolio their careers. So they might want to play in, and this is not unusual, like, but they might want to play with you know whoever it is that's touring, but that person can only afford to tour for perhaps two months a year on the back of what album they might have at the time. So they might only do 16, 18, 20 shows a year. Um, and the portfolio is that they also play in two or three other cover bands. Glenn and I have both been in that circumstance. But then they might also teach. Um, they might also do a number of other things. So I went into, when I came back from the United States in 2021, I think, I, I went into management. And I stayed in managing bands for 15 years. So I managed several bands, a, a girl band called Stonefield, a boy band called Motor Race, um, who were lucky, just fell in at the right time, not very successful. And then on the back of all, and, a, and, then, a, and then a guy called Michael Payne, who was subsequent, subsequently signed to Sony. Um, and out of that, <clears throat> underwhelmed by the, the Sony marketing story, I went and started teaching. I went and did my and did my masters and thought I need to know more about this stuff. Um, I'm not a writer, so uh, uh, th that led to probably I've been in working in academic sort of the academic world for the last 15 years, um, and I've just stepped down from a sort of course management position. So I've been playing, um, managing, uh, writing. Sorry, sorry, playing, managing, uh, and teaching or lecturing, if you like, and writing curriculum 
all at once. And running a studio. Oh, sorry. And then I ended up, uh, yeah, I had a post production studio for nine years as well. Right. So, um, yeah, a lot of stuff. In fact, too much stuff. And the thing that I'm getting back to now is just playing. I really love playing. So I resumed taking guitar lessons, something I haven't done for too many years to mention, because um, I, you know, like most guitar players, I'm self taught, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of guitar players, that is. And, um, yeah, so I think it's a portfolio of things that you need to be able to do. And I don't think, and I say this to my students, I teach at Box Hill Institute, I say this to my students, do not consider that, that, that you have to, that being a barista means that you're a barista. You're still a musician. You know, this is, we all have to do things to get through. Um, if you're an actor, you'd go from, you know, the chicken to the feathers. It's like, it's, it's you know, you might have a feature film and then you've got nothing for six months. So yep. you have to treat it somewhat like that. And you have to just multitask. You have to learn how to multitask. I fortunately was interested in a whole lot of other things. Um, the studio kind of felt business fell in my lap, but I wanted to learn. I wanted to, to learn about teaching. I wanted to do my masters. I wanted to do other things. Um, and uh, and I fell into management, and and luckily with a successful band, and then stayed. So um, yeah, it's just kind of riveted off. Yeah, fantastic. And Glenn, I'd love your perspective as well uh, on how you think things have changed over your time. I just, um, maybe it's just, bec I know that bands are still out doing it. I, I, it felt like um, back in the day, in the 80s, on the road touring and doing that kind of real hard road pig sort of touring, that there were more bands yeah, out there actually yeah. doing it. There were probably more venues and yeah, well, and there were more bands on the road. There were more Turagos <laughs> and Hiosas going up and down the Hume Highway than than I think there are now. Yeah. Um, so if you, as long as you didn't mind the lifestyle, you had a pretty good chance of being in a in a touring band, not making much money, um, and touring pretty hard and rough. But you know, as a young person in starting out in the industry, that was yeah. like kind of all we wanted. We just we want we wanted gigs. Wanted to play, yeah. You know, just wanted yep. wanted to play and and to see the country and to drink beer and meet girls, you know. So nothing changed. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's changed. Red wine probably for the beer, but everything else is the same. Is the same. One thing I've noticed a little bit differently to overseas, and like you know, obviously America's like just a massive sort of yeah. market. There's so just so many you know major cities, and and they're a lot closer together and everything. So it's very different. But as far as um, processes go. I, I think we tend to sort of silo ourselves here a bit. Like um, I see a lot more um, cross collaboration and mixing in 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 circles over there. Especially that was you know, what well, I noticed I think, in America. I have to say I think that happens with the students that I teach. So right. I think that happens there. Box Hill bought a studio called Sing Sing, a famous Melbourne studio called Sing Sing, and moved the yep. whole lot lock, lock and start lock block and start. Is it? All Lock, stock, and barrel. Thank you very much. Um, all the way out. To <laughs> and, and it's amazing. And they've got five other studios as well. The students there mix a lot. And not right. just within the confines of the of the campus, but also outside of that. Right. And they seem to know everybody in a lot of other bands as well. And they come in and they come out. So I, I, It might have changed. It's very healthy. Yeah. And Melbourne's got a lot of gigs. There's a lot of gigs. You know, like even, we're in St Kilda here, and, and even in a you know five-kilometre radius from this, there's a lot of little gigs too that... Well, once were shop fronts, New York style kind of little gigs, you know, Bitty, Bitty Bar. Um, there's another one up the road called Lavender. There's there's stacks of good little gigs around Lost. Um, there's probably six in walking distance from my house. So um, that seems to keep it going. And they're also feeding the older guys who still want to play. Um, so that's a good thing. Yeah, um, I'm really interested in, in, in both of your thoughts on where things are at now so for, for young people wanting to get into the industry now and you, you sort of touched on it then there's still gigs around like i know melbourne's got a really vibrant scene yeah. but i'm just sort of curious where things are at now if you're if you're a young uh, maybe original act and you're, you're starting out and you want to make a name for yourself is, is is the opportunity the same as it was is it different has it changed are the pathways different what what, what do you guys think about that no, let's, I'll let you take this one because the big, the biggest issue I think with the music industry, in particular, is someone who teaches it. So I'm running a, a curriculum for a subject called Future of Music at the moment, and we have six majors in that. There's performers, there's composers, there's songwriters, as dif as as defined from performers. There's studio techs, there's people who just want to work at home with Ableton, Logic, and Pro Tools, and then there's business students. So all six majors working together, 
and they have to learn as much about the industry as they have to as they do about their their specific major and they can pick business sub subjects and um, a lot of the business students are, are musicians so they'll pick music uh, musical subjects uh, uh, music oriented subjects but the business is saturated with songs every performing student knows how to use a door you know so they're all kicking up their own files whether it, whether it's a basic vocal file on garage band right through to a full mix on pro tools or ableton or logic you know, i mean billy eilish made an album phineas made an album on logic that, that 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 won six grammys that's the world we're in spotify gets sixty thousand songs a day something mm. like 14.88 million a year um mm. it's saturation the industry is saturated so i think it's a lot harder and i think the duration that people have success for is a lot shorter don't don't think we're going to see too many more Arctic Monkeys U2s or whatever. Certainly not a U2, certainly not a 40-year-old band, you know, 40-year band, but um, coming up in the future. Maybe, but, you know, we grew up through an incredible era. I just, I just, I saw a thing today where Bob Dylan released his first song in 1963. He's 81, <laughs> you know. Yeah. McCartney just headlined Glastonbury. He's 80. It's, you know, are we going to see these kids do that? I don't know. What are your thoughts? I, was, uh, I think that the audience moves on so quickly if you because their yeah. audience is not going to be us we'll be gone yep and i just see um Where you you know, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but i just see I, I i just see you know people latching on to a a I'm latching on to songs instead of artists yep. yeah that's i think true. that's the big difference yep. yeah, in, yeah. In some of the study that i've been doing they were saying people are going to start knowing artists and the other feeder for that is that they'll say, um, uh, Alexi, is that, is, that, is that the name of Google's talking machine? Alexa. Alexa. Play me a sad song. You know, or play me, a, play me the song that with such and such in it. And it might be a whole note song. It could be anything. But mm. she'll, she'll just, she'll, re she'll recognize that, our lyric and play that. Mm. And they will never know the artist. That's one of the predictions which has come from a guy called Ted Goya. And um, who's a who is actually a jazz uh, aficionado, but and has been around for a long time. But um, he, uh, yeah, that's what he thinks. People will know songs. And yeah. I, I think you raised some good points about the vision for the future there. And I, I'd actually plan to ask you a question. <laughs> I want to quote someone visionary you may never have heard of. So apologies for the question without notice. But I interviewed a guy called Ivor Davies in late two thousand and three. <laughs> And it was just as iTunes was really making uh, ground and it was becoming apparent that the days of physical music sales were, go were going. Um, and Ivor's comments back then were along the lines of, look, we'll be returning to sort of that medieval times of the travelling troubadour, that the only real money will be made by constantly performing live, which is funny when you're saying, you know, maybe you don't play as many shows <laughs> as you might like. But he sort of got that right, didn't he, back in 2003? If you look at you know, Glenn's playing with John Stevens, that... that what you just sold to um Palais. Palais, yeah. you know it's like it's extraordinary you know the level that of, and i think it's something that's extraordinary that happened in the 80s there certainly was a renaissance time in the 80s and, and i don't say that because i come from an 80s band but it certainly was i mean it was anything the vinyls the angels midnight oil you know acdc were more 70s band cultures similarly but so many noise work so many great bands came through that period of time and there's a lot of people who are in love with that music, you know, right down to Pseudo Echo, and I don't mean down to, but including Pseudo Echo and, and a whole bunch of other bands, the baby animals who hang off that period of time. And um, I, I'm not sure if the 90s produced that. I wasn't aware of it, of, of a legacy of it. I know we had a lot of great bands, certainly Silver Chair, certainly um, The Living End um, and, 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 and others. Um, but uh, the 80s just seemed to explode, you know. Um, but Ivor is right. He has called it right. And Bowie called the same thing. He said there'd be the, in 2001, he said there would be the death of um, music, music sales. So, you know, maybe I forgot it from him. He copies him a bit. He does copy Did him a bit. you notice that? Yeah, it does copy him Bloody a bit. copycat. <laughs> but, I mean, um, Paul and, Paul, you've... Uh, Closing the door because the heat is on. Yeah, Paul spoken, Paul's spoken to me, but you've spoken to me before too about how the advent, the, the the explosion of streaming, and and the and the way that that delivery service has changed as yep. as, as well, yep. um, uh, actually creates opportunities as well. It's not all downside. No, it's not. Um, I think finding a a, a long term artist is is the hardest thing, but exposure 
to older songs, particularly if we if we look at things like, and it's well spoken of, but if we, if we look at things of uh, like the guy with the with the bottle of ocean spray who went skateboarding through uh, Santa Monica to Dreams by um, Fleetwood Mac. Well, we yeah. Push the album rumors back into the physical charts at that, and the physical vinyl charts at number twenty one. You know, after after once that album's fifty years old, yeah. you know, it's one of the highest selling records in the world. But pushed it back, also pushed up the sales of Ocean Spray. But that yeah. was a TikTok <laughs> phenomenon. It was a TikTok phenomenon. And and here's the thing, Tick, but TikTok or Tencent, who owns TikTok, I think it's Tencent, bought twenty percent of Universal Music Group. Now that's the largest record company in the world. What does that tell you? And more recently, a company called um, Unreal Engine, who made Fortnite, bought Bandcamp. What does that tell you? I mean, it's what? about placement of music in games. Yeah. And, and, or is it culture? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, you know, music's kind of ubiquitous to popular culture or, or all cultures. And, and, and um, so, but we were seeing these, these quite extraordinary mergers occurring. Um, yeah, well, I think a, a recent example of how the, that music can still be relevant is what we're seeing with Kate Bush at the moment, too. Yeah, so and, I, I was just going to mention that as an example, yeah. uh, Paul, because. Um, you know, from a very small sample size of my kids, uh, of course they latched onto running up that hill for the same reason that everybody else did. And um, but we we're on a bit of a long uh, family car trip the other day, and I tried playing them more of Kate Bush's repertoire, and they were only interested in that song. Like as soon as it wasn't yeah. that song, they they were like, "Oh, come, you know." Can we listen to something else now, you know? So I just think... But there's that, been other uh, things. Stranger Things had a major impact on a lot of 80s music that came out and, yeah. that, and that pushed a lot of bands to the forefront. Yeah. Certainly every time... Quentin bands, they're all songs. Uh, songs, yeah, probably. Probably songs. That's a good point. So, so um, it's illustrating that point you made earlier where perhaps it's, it's the, the songs people songs. will latch onto rather than the artist. Yeah. yeah. I like that song. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and look, I mean... And a lot of the time with um, contemporary artists, there might not be an album to go and explore anyway um, because the way that music is released now, and you yep. could speak a bit about that, that it's, it's quite differently to like in the old days. You get your album together and then yep. you start releasing singles. A lot of people aren't doing that anymore. They'd, when they've got a song that they think is single worthy, something worthy of release, it goes up straight away. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and people don't make demos, do they really? I mean, if you put something mm. down... That's you might it. you might reamp it, or you might yep. do whatever, or you might change the keyboard part, or you might add a different keyboard. But yep. you're really starting to build a song from from scratch, yep. because everyone's digital recording, and the saturation yep. is also because everyone's got a digital recorder. We're we're, yep. we're all talking to each other on something that can record, and we could make a record. It wouldn't be great on GarageBand, but if I if I spend three hundred dollars and put Logic on this, then da, you know, it's about yeah. the space. It could be done in here. Um, this isn't. In fact, this whole house was built by a guy who built studios in Melbourne. So, um, and this it doesn't really qualify as studio. It's more of a guitar parlor than it is a studio. Um, but, but yeah, and you know what? That album, that first or that second, the main Billie Eilish album was recorded on the bus and at, the, at home. It yeah. goes on to win six Grammys. It's yeah. like, you know, we yeah. all talk about two thousand dollar a day studios. Is it are they viable? And well, we know they're not. Yeah, part of the. Um... Part of what made the the in that environment workable for Billie Eilish was the the level at which she sings. There was not oh, going she's to incredible this, singer. Um, but also like just volume wise, there wasn't going to be a lot of room sound bleeding yep. bleeding yep. into the microphone. It's like it, it's really right. just right there. Right. So yep. so you you can actually record that in a bedroom, yep. and the vocal quality is going to be exactly what you wanted, which is just yep. really soft but right up in your face. So. Um, you know, and, and here's the thing. She did also release a successful album, so there are there are exceptions to the general rules that we're putting out here, um, and has released subsequently released yes. successful albums, as has uh, um, Ed Sheeran, as has yes. Adele, um, and as has others who and and then um, <clears throat> as much as I might like to say that there, there's fewer career artists, we've got who's touring next year that's the biggest artist in Melbourne. It's our friends, um, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Who you know? Who are a bunch of guys in their sixties, and that seems to be something that's acceptable now. Well, certainly, you know. And, and well, particularly, I heard recently, and sorry, Paul, to jump in here, that um, someone made the assertion recently that the last big rock act, and I emphasise rock act, the last big worldwide rock act to break was the Foo Fighters. There's been oh. nothing since. Oh. 
and uh, we hear conversations. I have some friends at Frontier, and we hear, and a friend at um, a very good friend, in fact, and we're touring with with um, Live Nation at the moment, and they they struggle overseas to find a main act to finish off to play last at the night. They don't want to finish with a DJ, but it may be that a DJ or a hip hop artist, indeed, has the biggest song year yep. and has to do it. So. Hmm. Um, but there's not that big hands in the air rock band to play to finish the night off or to finish the tour, you know. So yeah. But quite strong, quite interestingly, because of that that um, that kind of darth of, of of that particular kind of band, you know, the kind of the big stadium rock filler band. rock headliner yeah. rock band, that some bands have been. I don't say that they don't deserve it. They're amazing bands, but a band like Muse, for instance, yeah. right, which is almost more like an art rock band, right, that, that you wouldn't expect them to be headlining no. Glastonbury, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm nothing against Muse. I think they're fantastic, but it's, it's a little unusual in a way, right? So, so it, you've got to put someone there, right? Yeah. And then you've got, but but I think we're all so a little bit defeatist in this country that we're always looking for rock and alternative rock, and we've, we're we're a bit. We're a bit too Triple J focused for young bands, and and in fact, um, it's it's not Live Nation. It's the other one that comes out of Texas, a big international promoter, who said, you know, it's it's actually a bad thing to get paid on Triple J and to fall into that algorithm. And I don't understand the algorithm effect, but he says it's kind of come over here and play. That's how it's going to do it. And guess what? That's what ACDC. That's what the Bee Gees. That's what the Easy Beats. Yeah. That's what everyone did back yeah. in the sixties and seventies. And for a lot of people, it hasn't changed. And we never hear about them, but bands like Rufus to Soul, bands like um, our friend from Sleepy Jackson, what's the name of his band? Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to think of it, but I'm not going to. Well, I was just. Um, I was they just, spend all the time living in America. Yeah, yeah, and I was reading a. Coming back here. Often, like, you know, it probably says more about how out of touch I am with the industry than anything else, but. I often read in the culture section of our um, sort of flagship masthead here in, in Melbourne uh, about, you know, bands that have, you know, had been coming back to Australia after successful European and American tours and they're headlining this and headlining that. And I'm going, I haven't heard of, yeah, haven't right. heard of them. Right, right. right? Yeah. So Amel and the Sniffers, uh-huh. bands like that, yeah, you know, yeah. okay, like that's not been on my radar, yeah. you know. So... There's, a, there's, there's so many the other things like, you know, talking about, you know, the challenges in the business. There are so many little circles of yeah. business yeah. out there. Yeah. There's so many places to go. This, so one of the other predictions that I've just been reading about is that um, that the, the growth in streaming, because in fact, Spotify has kind of stalled at three and a half, mm. what, what, 300, 350 million people. It's kind of stalled there. And mm. about 100 of those are people who aren't paying. The subscription fee, so they're oh, they're freemiums. You yeah, know. Yeah. Um, it will be in other nations. It will be other music. It will be in places that gets access to instant internet, and um, streaming will become more affordable in some of those areas. So they expect that that will start to localize those areas. So there's some really interesting things that are going to come out of that. And we're talking, uh, we're talking South America, we're talking Saudi Arabia, and those kinds of places. Or sorry, the the Arabian continent um, yeah. or the Arabian area and Africa and Africa. Um, so New Zealand, and New Z- Tasmania, <laughs> yeah, because they they had power down there. Well, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you're getting color tally next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you go out to do you go out to, to Tasmania? This broadcast. Yes, well, <laughs> we occasionally we occasionally find our way to the Apple Oil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are international, so we must go to Tasmania. We oh, must yeah. go overseas. Only three yeah. people can watch it because that's the band. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> Hey, um, on, on this this subject, and just to take it a bit further, I'm I'm interested in your take, Glenn. You mentioned right at the start about talking to uh, students about making a passive income out of music, and I've always sort of thought one of the great ways to do that, uh, maybe in the old days, was to write a killer song and and get royalties from from that. Is this still a, a viable thing? Um, how many people are able to do that? What other forms of passive income are there potentially out there for people in the industry and the last bit you guys were talking about spotify um you know we hear we hear that the the revenue stream from spotify is pretty thin Uh, i'd love to get both your perspectives on that paul knows a lot about all the numbers around uh what money is going where and how out of those uh, subscription or or free streaming services 
um, I can tell you in the library music uh, industry, like everything else, it's getting squeezed. Um, it's getting saturated. The sort of money that you would used to get uh, for a play of a track is nothing it, it, like it's nothing like that now. Um, people, companies used to pay um, up front for delivery of a of a master of a collection of songs, um, and then go distribute it for you and split the royalties fifty fifty. Um, now. They would pay nothing. You might not get a 50-50 split and they might even be asking you to do all the metadata stuff as well, all the tagging stuff, which is a huge job in itself. Um, so it's changing. So that just like everything else, it's like the, the uh, returns get smaller. Yep. Um, and the only way to succeed in, really succeed in library music is to saturate. So the people that do really well have got, you know, 4,000 tracks out there. Right. So you know, heaps of albums. So, uh, yeah, so it's very hard because, like, there's so much out there, it's hard to go through particular genres without coming across some of that person's output. Um, you've got to kind of be everywhere. That, and and the, the really successful people are pulling in, you know, sort of mid-six figures stuff. Right with it oh. but yeah they're churning out 20 songs a week and okay. they've been doing it for okay. 10 years and okay. you know yeah so uh that's that's as far as the library music stuff goes paul knows a lot about how the revenue streams work out for um you gotta get a lot of streams to make any money at all i think that's mm -hmm. why, that's why you know i'm not telling anybody anything we all know that People like Dean Lewis a few years ago with um, the hits that he had, and he had number one in America. And on certainly, and we, we forget bands like um, Five Seconds of Summer, Five mm. Seconds to mm. Summer, three number one American albums. Yep. But, mm. but the sales of physical records not existing has really hurt the industry. It really, really hurt the industry. So performance... It hasn't hurt the record companies, though. It has. Uh, but they, they, that record companies all did a deal with mm. the streaming agents yes. because they, the streaming agents... I.e. Spotify, they needed content. Apple, they needed content. Yeah. So they're always going to win. Um, the, the, the best way to win in the business is to own the content and and um, and own the device that it's played on, i.e. Sony buying um, CBS, mm -hmm. the oldest record company in the world, Columbia, uh, are Sony buying that. That was Sony going, okay, we've just lost out, we're going to lose out to iTunes, <laughs> and, on, and then iTunes doing a deal and saying, well, we're a computer company. So I think moving forward, or I don't think, I, uh, I read moving forward, it's all going to be those Silicon Valley type companies, the Google, the, the Apples, and the Amazons, who are going to control a lot of what happens in the music industry because they're controlling the players. You know, and and you, can, you can sort of understand why your Springsteens and Neil Youngs and that have sold their back catalogs for incredible amounts of money. Yep. Half a billion dollars for Springsteen sold to Hypnosis. I can never say it because of the G in it. But, and there's another company that's buying them up. Dylan did the same. Stevie Nicks did the same. Tina Turner, who I didn't know would have such a catalogue, did the same. Neil Young did the same. They've all sold them for 300, 400, 500 million dollars. Um, and now I don't know whether they're doing it because there's an inevitability about what's going to occur to them, to all of us, and, and they want to sort of clean the slate before, um, or if they just want to, I mean, they can't possibly need the money. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that's a strange, that's a strange thing. But it does say a lot about the value of the song. Uh, moving forward yes. in things like, I mean, I just finished Peaky Blinders, like probably half the country, you know, and, and that's all music supervision except for the last series. And it's got incredible tracks. We're All Blood, Tom York, Tom York with Radiohead, Tom York without Radiohead. Um, and of course, uh, um, uh, so many uh, songs from our Australian compatriot who wrote Red Right, Red right Hand. Um, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Uh, Big Cave. Big Cave. God, it's got the only Aussie in it. But, I mean, it's amazing. And that, you know, who, whoever was the music supervisor for that has, has found the songs that fit with the period drama from the 1920s, you know, 1922 to, to 1931, in, 1920, in 2022. And it's a brilliant. It's the, you know, the abrasion of that music could go off against the pitches is fantastic, you know. So um, in a movie which is really about PTSD, you know, guys coming back from the First World War and forming gangs, you know. Um, so 
you know, this brush with sort of, 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 of this sort of collusion with culture in, in its all forms and gaming, which we haven't spoken about, but we need to speak about, um, has been, it has, it can't, can't go unnoticed. And, you know, as I said, Unreal Engine, who wrote for, who, who, who built Fortnite, bought Bandcamp. Now, if they bought a record company, you kind of understand it. But I could also understand that Sony might decide that uh, PlayStation should have its own record label because of the songs that they mm. put on PlayStation. Yep. Um, uh, so Plus also, like, I mean, you could launch a band. You launch an artist. You can so, launch an yeah. artist on PlayStation. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the rap artist, um, Scott, who was on there, I'm going to get his name as well. Um, Travis Scott. Tra- thank you. Travis Scott played to 100 million people. How many opportunities can you get to do that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let's talk gaming. It, it's, it's, it's timely. We interviewed um, Chris, Christopher Norton, who plays keyboards for Cirque du Soleil. Oh, wow. And he's moving to my hometown of Adelaide very soon. And he was, he was telling us on the, the podcast that one of the, the projects he's going to get involved in when he, when he moves here to Australia is him and his, his wife are setting up a company where they're publishing music for, for video games. And um, you mentioned, Paul, this is something we should discuss in some depth. So uh, let, let, wh- how, what's the, what's the music scene like in terms of the content for games and where's this going? The biggest for gaming is the gaming industry is 29 times the size of the music industry. So the music industry, the aria from this is just physical sales. This has got nothing to do with live music. Live music's worth something like two and a half billion pre-COVID. Bigger than football, cricket, uh, rugby league, basketball, um, Everything put together, people bigger than more, sport. Big, bigger than sport in Australia, which is extraordinary. It blows you out, and people go, "No, no, no, can't be." But this is true. If you go to the LPA, the Live, Live um, Performers Association, they're the figures that they've done on it. It's massive. Obviously, COVID kicked that completely in the bar. But gaming went up by uh, annually. Uh, sorry, went up by um, globally by twelve and a half percent during COVID, as you'd expect. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's already a business which is 29 times the size of the music business worldwide. Wow. Now, the music business worldwide is under $20 billion. It peaked at about $26 billion in 1999, and then Napster came along, and it dropped to $15 billion. We've seen growth now for the last six years in Australia uh, in particular, but we're the sixth market in the world, and that growth is still less or just over half a billion dollars. It's not a massive industry, you know, it's not... It's 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 not up there with Foxtel, mm. but, you know. It's not it's not doing those kind of figures, but it is a conduit and also a destination spot for composers these days, which might have been once. I only want to compose feature film. Mm. I mean, if I got a gig composing score for a Netflix production mm. that ran over a ten year period, mm. Peaky Blinders. No, that's 50. it. You're done. Really? Retired? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um. And, and also the quality of that work, you know, or if you've got the Sopranos, you know, like it's, 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 it's a real good calling card. And the other part is what Glenn touched on, breaking an artist, you know. Um, it might be that you are a composer who is also a producer or also an artist. And we've seen that crossover between producers and artists occur in the last 10 years, particularly in dance music. So I think we're just going to see a lot more of that. And if, if you get picked up by it for a game, um, Paul, I'm imagining the revenue has to be better than, say, your Spotify's or even your better players like, um, I think Deezer plays slightly better and, and um, Apple Music, as far as that, those appalling rates, the majority of people can't make a living. But if you do get picked up from a gaming viewpoint, I'm assuming the, the royalties are slightly better. I wonder about this because my son uh, doesn't anymore, but played a lot of FIFA games and, and, and there was all this really awful um, Euro trash kind of, you know, disco on it, and uh, and I'd be like, well, how do you know this song so well? It's like, well, we just heard it on repeat, repeat, repeat. And there's a huge contest to get your song on those sorts of games. Now, people make money from um, from places like APRA, Australasian Performing Rights Association, or, or PRS, Performing Rights Association, Society in, in the United Kingdom, and then we've got, you know, the, the three that exist in the United States as well. I don't know if they can tell if the game is online, they could probably tell how many times the song's being played. But really, they can only take the money out of what's called a mechanical royalty, and that Which is the my game, game is being put into your, your into your box, mm-hmm. you know, into your machine. You paid eighty dollars for it. Correct, whatever the case may be, or you know, if we've got a name act, maybe it's thousands of dollars to to go in there. But um, 
I'd, I'd say they'd spend most of their money on having Ronaldo or a, a fake Ronaldo in there or using his number than they would, you know, the music. But but for, in terms of breaking an artist, it's still important. So that it may not be that you're making a lot of money from the game, but if it's breaking you into other territories, then all the kids know about it and the radio station has to start playing it. And so you prompted a really good question there too, because one of the... Um rationales used for using things like Spotify in spite of the appalling pay is it's about exposure and obviously you can you also hear about the live performance you know great if you're starting out play here for nothing or near nothing for exposure what's your take on Spotify or the streaming platforms as a promotional platform is that an arguable position um, and and if so well where does the real money come from once you've got that exposure well, it's like you're standing in a crowd of millions going, yeah, yeah. look at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is it exposure? It's not exposure. It's... it's um... Well, it's global exposure, which you normally would have get when we no, have... But exposure had happens when somebody market. sees or hears yeah, yeah. what you've done. That's that's exposure, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. You're, just, you're just in the race, really, aren't you? You're another, you're another bull in the race. It's, um, there's just too many. We talked about saturation before. I think it's really difficult unless you've got two or three other touch points, you know. One of them might be you're in a game. One of them might be you're on Peaky Blinders or something else at the same time. One of them might be that somebody in your band's done something extraordinary, you know. Yeah, um, but uh, look, it is becoming more challenging too because of the curated set list, song list phenomenon. Yeah. So um, as, you know, everybody's getting fatigued by the tyranny of choices, that, that we have too, ma too many choices yeah. and you're not sure where to look, and it's so much easier to let the streaming service choose your music for you based yeah. on what the sort of things that you like. Or the mood you're in. Yeah. 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 And, and that, that's not going to include a whole lot of... Uh, if, if, I, if I go into one of those, I'm not going to hear a lot of obscure no. artists. I'm not going to hear something from a little indie band down the street that have got their stuff up. That's all... And you that, won't know who you, if you have anyway, yeah, unless and, it comes uh, across your screen in the. And that could be paid placement too. Yep. So for the uh, for the people with the resources to do it, they yep. pay the record companies yep. prom promoting a, a major artist or a new release by a major artist. I'm sure that there'd be a bit of quid pro quo in uh, in terms of placing stuff in curated set lists and and. Um, See, this is not new. If you, if you think back it's to... It's the same as with the radio. Well, no, you think back to the... Even further than that. Well, sorry, not further than that. But the very first anal the machine that contained analytics was the jukebox. Right. Because if you could get... You know, if you're one of 100 um, songs... That, sorry, 100 singles that were in that jukebox, yeah. and the man that came around once or twice a month, probably wasn't women in those days, it was probably men, um, came around once a month and went, wow, this has been played 400 times. I'll, I'll just put a new copy of this in there. Yep. It's just the, the, the only thing wrong with this is that it's wearing out. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Get the, these ones, three or four copies. And I have analytics. And I also know in which parts of America yep. they're working. Yeah. You know? So uh, I, I, that was dispelled and no one really used it. Well, I don't think they used that information, mm. but it would have been a good good spot for payola for the record company yep. to go, you just keep it in there, yep. you know? Yeah. Like, just playing it on the radio. Or also, like, which spots on the number yeah. punching thing yeah. were, like, you know. Yeah. Prior to that, um, it was GIs who were taking soul records and stuff all around the world. So soul got into the UK because the American GIs yeah. were taking all of their records into the UK yeah. and their blues records as well as, you know. And the other thing is that they didn't have the racism issues that, that America did, yeah. so those artists could play there. Yeah. Um, similarly with jazz. You know, they could go and play in France and the United yeah. Kingdom do all of that sort of stuff with those kinds of issues that were that, that were related to them. And 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 uh, the kids loved them. They just went, This is amazing. In fact, that's why ha that's why we have the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. You know, it's like it's uh yeah. Are there other phenomena I think like, you know, it's kinda of, you were talking before about how, you know, as streaming becomes accessible to more and more people in areas around the world that maybe don't um, have it yet. And what they will mean, like, yes, Africa will have, that won't mean that Africa will necessarily become Americanized. <clears throat> no. They'll have their own really streaming so. scene well, there hope, of, yeah. of, of, you know, but... Um, of their own material. Well, yeah. I really hope so. I hope yeah. we don't get this complete homogenization where everything's locked in, you know. But it, one of the good things that's come out of all this sort of accessibility and um, more globalized music 
business mm -hmm. is uh, so K-pop is like a, a, a thing outside of Korea now. Well, so, in fact, BTS was the biggest selling band in the, in the yeah, world yeah, last year. Yeah, and and uh, and um, another thing, one of the lectures that I'm I'm getting this woman called Sarah Guppy to come in, and Sarah's fabulous, but she spends a lot of time in Asia. She's there at the moment running a a, a, um, a forum, and uh, she's saying. It's, you know, what we, sh what we should really be doing, and there's been discussions around all this all the time, and the William Morris Agency now has an, agent, um, an agency in, in Singapore. There's other Australian agencies that are moving, other Australian and American agencies that are moving into, into to Asia. A tour like yours, or like mine, not now because it's too late probably in terms of the songs, but we should, a uh, One Direction should certainly be considering Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia with the 700 million people, um, uh, Bali, whatever else, you know, places that, that's Indonesia, but places that they could go on tour and possibly even into India that they could go and do their tours. So all of a sudden, a seven-week Australian tour becomes a 17-week tour because that's what we grew up on. When I started with James, that was 13-week tours around Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. And then we'd stop, he'd release another single, we'd go out again, you know. Yeah. Um, similarly, I played with a guy called Rick Price. He did the same thing. Stop, put another single, we'd go out again for another 13 weeks. Can't do that anymore. You do the whole country and the, the number of gigs that you need to do in three weeks. Although you seem to be able to find lots of places to play. Yeah. Uh, is it the renaissance then, of festivals, do you reckon? Like the Red Hot the, Summers and the Day Well, the, the, the festivals help you underpin right. something. They give you um, things to hang right. three other, three or four other gigs uh, on. Yeah, yeah, because they so, pay enough for... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and so, yeah, you can... Well, John can... When when we're working, I'm home for like two nights a week. Yeah, right. You know, so that goes back so to the '80s, doesn't it? It goes back <laughs> to the '80s. So it is doable, and that's not doing just basically playing at the envelope, opening of an envelope either. That's doing like the big theaters, yep. um, some festivals. But you will play we, at the opening of an envelope. Well, I, I would. Yeah, I would. I would. So I mean, we we um, in and in in John's tours now, it will be very sparingly sprinkled with the big beer bun gigs, like a, a, a beer barn that holds like 1,200, 1,500 people. Yep. Yep. Um, that's actually more from the point of view of kind of keeping the soul of the band alive as, as, as a rock band. You know, yep. that if, if we're only doing theatres all the time, I, it could go. It, runs out it, quickly, it could yeah. kind of go off the off yeah. the boil a little yeah. bit, you know. But to just go back into the sweat and the dripping walls and and the fights and everything yeah. um, is is kind of. That's just in the band room. That's just in the band room. <laughs> yeah. And then, <laughs> and then guys, uh, I'm glad you just jumped onto the subject of touring because I've been wanting to ask you both a question around touring now in the sense of post COVID and the risk management that needs to sit behind that. Cause obviously if, if we if we have certain personnel in bands that, that aren't well, then they're not able to tour, which can obviously throw planning awry and then maybe we're rescheduling shows. So I'd, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on how that's being handled and how it could be handled. And is it causing problems? Cause problems with us. What about you? Well, to, well to our drummer Paul Wheeler, who's been in the band for I've been in the band for thirty three years as I says, he's been for thirty six years. Rang to that. We've got a gig tomorrow night in Sydney. It's a corporate gig, and mm -hmm. very few corporate gigs. But we're doing one for HP, not the source, the computer company, and um, <laughs> uh, he's got COVID, so we have to throw in another drummer. And also our guitar player, uh, uh, Michael Painter, who plays with, with us. He's also playing with Jimmy Barnes at the moment. He's on a he was on a plane to he's on a plane to New Zealand. So we're going to have to do the band with four out of six guys. Now there's normally sixteen of us on the road. That includes the truck, or seventeen if you include the truck driver. So we've gone back to the eighties in terms there's of three that three crew for every band member. It's just stupid, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's not stupid. It's great actually. But um and and uh and they they're the best of the best. One of the reasons we're not touring at the moment is. Five of our guys are off with Midnight Oil in the United States. Four of our guys are off with, with the Midnight, Midnight Oil. Oil. Yeah, yeah, in the United States and and Canada. So, um, and Ivor doesn't want to go out with anything less than than you know a, a, a monitor guy who probably gets paid seven hundred bucks a day to, you know, mm. and that's all he does. He's not packing trucks. You know, it's like he's very good at it. So touring is good if you only want to limit it. I guess we're the two examples of it. Um, John seems to be able to find all of these places to tour. 
Iva only wants to tour at a certain level. We carry all our lights. Three quarters of the semi is lights and staging. Sure. Um, John probably doesn't carry his own light show. We or... took a truck this time, but okay. not a semi. Okay. But we took a truck. Okay, yeah. Took like an eight tonner or something, okay. or you yep. know, ten yep. tonner or something. There you go. But yeah. I don't get for Ice House that pays off too, because it doesn't matter what gig, and I've seen you guys a few times, the quality of the sound and the lighting and everything is just absolutely top notch. And you can see why, because you, you've got it nailed down. Everything is actually synced too these days. Yep. Um, um, every, the, the screen, the, LC, the LED screens, everything is synced. And um, so the show just kind of runs a bit like a theatre show, I suppose. I mean, he, he can pull it up and stop it any, any time he wants. But um, uh, And then there's songs that we don't, I mean, everything runs to a click track. Uh, there's, that's no secret. We have a full-time Pro Tools operator on stage. That's no secret. No, we don't have vocals and a whole bunch of all of that stuff. We have things like return vocals. We have printed um, delays. Printed echoes. Very Pink Floyd trick to make it sound bigger. And, you know, the whole thing is in, always in stereo. Um, so, but yeah, they spend a lot of time doing lights, filming things. Um, that's just what... He that's he you know if he can't present it like that he doesn't want to do the gig. The COVID the COVID aspect of all this is um, I don't I I don't know any bands that haven't been hit yeah. with it and had to postpone some shows. Um, you did the big blues fest so one where everyone at blues it. blues fest which I call flu fest because <laughs> um, uh, everybody went through basically every band that played there so. Um, which would have been millions of dollars. I mean, you're talking crowded house, you guys, lots and lots of people. And it, millions of dollars would yeah. have been lost as a result. Of yes, that, and and, and but I mean, outside of actually, you know, people getting sick. I feel a little bit sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, was just the um, like, well, you know, our our John's manager and uh, and booking agent putting together tours that didn't happen and they had to keep doing it over and over and over and I, i'm so glad i didn't have that job because it after i'll just be heartbreaking you know just like why am i i know i'm booking all these gigs i know i'm going to get the rug pulled out from under me yep. so anyway look we're past that but well we're not because tomorrow we're going to i'm going to sydney and paul who's done every yeah, gig I, every gig for, for yeah he's not going that's un, that's the unusual gigs, it's the gigs not at the level on. it was on it yeah. was it was shocking for a while yeah really shocking. at least the, the 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 gigs are on i don't know anybody if, do you know anyone in the industry well, we know one very unfortunate one we, um but um generally people didn't get horribly ill no no i know a couple of i know a couple got knocked off the twig but um but I don't. I don't know. Um, of other hospitalizations. You no, know, I think. Like I that. think the whole thing we're ignoring here is all of the crew. Yeah. A massive amount of crew that just completely rely on it. I mean, I don't rely on music for a living. I, you know, I, I took a left turn many years ago. I loved playing, and you're sitting in a room that's got fifteen guitars in it and five amps. You know, it's like uh, I still love playing, and and in fact, more now than ever. Um, uh, but but. I don't rely on it for a living. Glenn probably more so. No, mm. I do certainly more so than I do. Um, but you still have other. Glenn's a very bright bloke. I know he doesn't look it, <laughs> but he's a very bright man, <laughs> and and um, so he can turn. You know, he can turn his uh, himself into, into all sorts of other. Turn his turn his hand into other things. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on my hands and knees. <laughs> Drill, drilling, uh, drilling, decking. Look, he built, me, he built me this amp. Is it still working? Oh yeah, he built me this amp. Can you see that? It's an old radio. I like converting. Oh, that's I like, amazing. I know. Cool. Like getting old defunct radios and turning them into guitar amps, and this one's really cool because oh, so it's a Chrysler, yeah. <laughs> so there's, that's that's your on-off volume. That's your. Well, it to me that's your tone, tone, and, and which I think the um, the actual tuning thing with the little needle goes along here is the is the drive i think from memory that's amazing anyway. well, it's really work. embarrassing if it doesn't work now paul well, if the <laughs> well, we do have an adapter for it too I think. Is so right? is, is this a real guitar paul or is this one of these one-fingered chord guitars <laughs> 
This is a four hundred dollar nineteen seventy eight Japanese guitar, and I love it. It's a. I bet you it's worth more than four hundred now. Uh, well, the, I put six hundred dollars worth of pickups in. But yeah, I bought it because I really love the neck. It's a status. Yeah. Um, I've been sort of fishing through these old Japanese guitars because there's so many great ones through the through the late seventies and the early eighties, and and buying a few and. Yeah, I don't know. Are we got anything happening? Has the Where's battery the... gone? To... No, no, yeah. I can see a red light. Okay. Oh. This is interesting, interesting viewing, folks. Just hang on. With my... Was it? Where's the volume? Where's, where's the volume on this thing? Jesus. Oh, I might be plugged into the wrong part. <laughs> 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 Yeah, That's good. Awesome. I like building things. I've built 40 guitars myself, um, cigar great. box guitars. I got into building cigar box guitars. In fact, one of them is with the famous comedian uh, Bill, Bailey. Bill Bailey. He's actually oh, got wow. them. He uses them in his show. Yeah. And uh, yeah. what, what about building saxophones, Glenn? That can't be that hard. Can't be that hard. Bit of PVC. <laughs> bit of PVC and a black and decker drill, and off you go. That's right. Yeah. No, that was brilliant, guys. Thank you. And um, would you believe uh, we've had so much interest in you guys coming on? We've actually got some uh, viewer questions. Now, I've, I've curated the thousands of questions down to two key ones. Um, so the first one actually comes all the way from Canada. So we've got uh, Tammy in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, apparently over there, they're starting to run into bands playing and having exclusivity or radius clauses so that if they play somewhere... Uh, at a certain time they can't come back there and play for a period of time or within you know a five kilometer square radius have you come across that or heard of that starting to creep in i haven't in australia but i thought that was an interesting um little yeah. thing that's common. happening well, it's common it's um it's uh especially uh where the venue is relying on some of their revenue coming from ticket sales if it's a share um so you're doing blues fest. They don't want you playing. Uh, if, yeah. They don't want you like, playing. You know, every other little place around the road. If you're one of the main bands, that is, that's for sure. It's usually, like a couple of hours or something is the kind of the travel the, distance. The travel distance, yeah, something like that. It, but, but it can be the only thing. The only clause that I used to get away. If you played at if you played Brisbane or you played at the university, they don't care. But if you play at Brisbane and you play at one of the major uh, venues or you play at the Brisbane Entertainment Centre, sorry, someone was a promoter who put you on at the Brisbane Entertainment Centre and met your hefty bill, then they don't want you coming up and playing at Bundaberg. They don't want you playing in, in areas around there that are going to dilute the ticket sales. So that's pretty common. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, it doesn't, sometimes it's not, it doesn't happen. It's because the artist is also the promoter and they're kind of taking all the risk. And it really, you know, if, if they're, yeah. if yep. they're yeah. oversaturating by playing too close yeah. together in too short a time, they're really just um, cutting their own cutting throats, their own throats yeah. anyway. Yeah. 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 No, excellent. And the other question was from Kyle from Brisbane, Australia. So, um, why why are Paul Gilday and Glenn Wright are not hosting their own podcast? <laughs> Too lazy. We're not industrious like you two guys. Yeah. <laughs> we, we did talk about radio. We used to do these ice house get together things. Mm. You were very funny, Glenn. Thank you. Yeah, we did. One I was drinking in those yeah. days. <laughs> Don't you drinking? I'm not drinking so much at the moment. No. Oh. Yeah. I remember we did one in Canberra and Bill Shorten was at the gig mm. and I came out of the toilet, you know, doing, I came out of the bathroom. Bill Shorten got... uh, came very close to being a, a, a Prime Minister of Australia for all our overseas friends. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Bill Shorten was there and uh, the whole thing was very embarrassing, but never, never, nevertheless, but we were creating because one of the guys in the crew used to film us doing stuff together, just bantering, talking shit basically. And um, as we have for what, the last yeah. hour or so. Yeah. Yeah. But we've enjoyed it. Well, well I we, think, yeah. Don't, I was, I was going to say we, we've enjoyed having you guys uh, uh, talking shit too. It's been, it's been very, very elucidating. So thank you so much. Um, we do have a, a, a question, um, which I think you'll both definitely have uh, thoughts on, which is, if if you could provide a newcomer just with some some packaged advice on 
they want to make a career in the music industry, A, should they try? And B, what would just be the key things I need to get right? You do one, I'll do one. Uh, okay. Yes, they should try, absolutely, unquestionably. There's, people are driven. You know, I think people who's – people might have a, a – a, Willie Nelson still does gigs, you know. It's been a long time since Stardust, the album Stardust was famous, but it's not going to stop Willie Nelson doing gigs and writing songs. And I think people who, who, who draw, people who make um, amplifiers out of, you know, or some guy, box guitar, you're driven to do it. It's what you do. You're going to do it with yourself. I mean, I played with James for a long time. I played with him when he was in his golden period. He was signed to Virgin in the UK. He's still out there doing gigs. He still makes records. In fact, he's, the record he made last year is a great record, you know, a really great record. But he, as James always says, my biggest competitor on the radio is me. You know, they're going to play Australian yeah. Crawl yeah. before they play me. So I guess you should do it definitely. Two, it's about branding in the contemporary um, uh, pop industry, it's about branding as strongly as it is about the songs. But you still need to have a great song. So, yes, Billie Eilish was young, but there's always been young performers. There was there was a very young uh, Stevie Wonder, little Stevie Wonder, who was a 13 when he broke. So it's not a new phenomenon being young. Um, but he was great. Billie Eilish is great. The songs are great, you know. So you, you can do that. And... The other story, what's your secondary story? With them it was, it's her and her brother. They were hot housed, i.e. they were taught at home. Would that have happened if they was exposed to going to school and as much as other kids did, you know? Um, so that became the secondary story. And, and in a lot of cases, because we're all gossip heads, we want to know. You know, our friend I love, who sang Beautiful, who drove the tank in, you know, uh, what's his name? What's his name? What's his name? I've had a terrible, terrible time with names. Um, James you're Bryan. beautiful. James yeah, Bryan. Beautiful, yeah. It was all about he used to be a tank driver. In, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, you know, oh man, you say, you need a gimmick. I go, Dad, you don't understand. You know, it's, it's got to be, and actually, my dad was right. You know, there does need to be another thing. A story. Well, so, I mean, you know, that's what. The story is what everybody's looking for in 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 everything. I mean, the advertisers are looking for a story to put with their beans. Yeah, you know, what, yeah. whatever. It's, it's it's no different. But I do. You've often said to me, you said like the song is the thing, right? Oh, always. The you, you you there's no substitute for a great song. No. Um. So and they and they are hard to come by. I mean, you've yep. had you know times where. You know, you've complained to me about like I just can't find that song yep. that I need for this for this uh, yeah, yeah, for yeah, this yeah. for this particular thing I'm working yep. on. Yep. I need a great song. You know how hard it is to find a great song. Yep. You know. Yep. Um, the other look, I, I, the other thing is um, a lot. There's a lot of uh, people with kind of like a, a, a sort of a bit of a vague idea about wanting to be in the industry, but, and you know, I'll say particularly musicians, right? Yep. Wanting to be in the industry. And um, not really working that hard, you know. It's really hard work. You've days. got you have to, like, if you want to be a guitar, you say, "I want to be a guitarist." That's what yeah. I want to do, yeah. right? Yeah. You better be on that guitar six hours a day. Yeah. You better be. Yeah. You know when and, you and see even more so if you want to be an artist because of all of the social media commitments and the other. It's yeah. elite. It's elite athlete. Amounts of time. You're talking about BTS before because yeah. they, they they've been brought out up in this system yeah. where they'd be lucky if they got six hours off work each day. Yeah, you know, they'll have them going eighteen hours easy yeah. a day, and yeah. you know all, all the choreography, and then the next yeah. things, and the yeah. next things, and the next things, and yeah. um, so it's almost be careful what you wish for, but don't be lazy. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of fuzzy sort of wishing type thinking that I, that I see uh, with um, young people sort of saying, oh, I want to be, you know, this is go like, I haven't seen you in the practice rooms. Know, you know really? what, the, be careful what you wish for is a big one because sometimes people also, I think a lot of people are frightened of success. Yeah. They have something successful, the market decides whether it's successful or not, they don't know what to do next with it. Mm. And and so the, the, the fact that people have a limited career, yes, it's a, it's, it's a, um, a fundamental issue that, that that's in, associated with um, saturation, but it's also a lot of people don't know what, where to go from here. I always have this theory, particularly with this management, that everybody has one good song, you know, <laughs> and you get back in the day cassettes and then later on CDs and, and then whatever, and people then sending you stuff on on, on um, sound. 
cloud. But um, and it'd be like, this is such a great song. This is not. <laughs> yeah. And it's like it's the second, third, and fourth song that establish it. Mm. And if we take it all the way back to the Beatles and all the Stones, but particularly the Beatles, it, it was it's the it runs so deep. Yeah. It runs so deep in terms of great songs. You know, you can sort of go, I don't, I should actually, I do know that song. And people say, I don't like you too. I go, really? I understand you may not like Bono or him being a particular, you know, or, or, or how, but but you're going to tell me that it's it's a beautiful day. It's not a great pop song, yeah, yeah. you know, or yeah. um, there hasn't been great songs throughout that period. To, to keep that up is hard, hard work. And they can't possibly be driven by the financial necessity of it any longer. Um, why tour, you know, at 62 or whatever it is that they are? Why tour? Uh, why put so much effort into the shows? that Their shows are phenomenal. Coldplay similarly, it, but you two in particular, because they've been going since 1979, you know. I mean, the other thing is, and like uh, uh, we tend to talk about the, the really high echelons yep. of the business as, yep. as we are right now. Um, but actually, that's not where most of the music business is. Most of the music business just lives, lives in, in the guts of it and even even below that, you know. And, and to, to be successful in that part of the business, you've just got to not stop. Just don't stop. Like when everybody else is like, you know, can't pay my rent, uh, I'm giving up, I'm like this stuff is, you know. I'm gonna, I can't do this anymore. You keep going. Cause... That, and that is one thing that could be learned from the past. I don't know whether either of you guys have read, I think it's Stuart Coop that wrote that roadies book. And I've never seen a better description of what it was like in the 70s and 80s, the reality of touring. That is essentially the level of work you've got to do nowadays. That does still apply today. Yep. Perseverance is a major thing. Just yeah. don't stop when everybody else has given up and moved on and somebody's looking for yep. a guitarist. Yep. Be, the, be the guy that's still doing it. You know, yeah. or the girl still yeah. doing it. Yeah. You know, yeah. just be the one that's still there. And there are so many great. I mean, there's so many women enrolled in the course that I'm doing, and there's so many people who we started off or we ventured into the area of portfolio of work. You know, someone who's a guitar player, but he's also a producer, as um, or, or rather, a woman who's a guitar player is also a producer, mm -hmm. um, can also play a bit of drums, and can also do that. Another phenomenon that that that, that I want to touch on just really quickly is. Um, is that is that it seems that the modern session musician is at home these days? Yep. Because because you, you don't need to go anywhere, you know. So, um, uh, what, one of the guys that's in our band, he does he spends all his time at home on Pro Tools, uh, collaborating on yeah, sending remote sessions to Norway, Canada, Canada. Uh, it's like, what are you doing today? He said, oh, I'm doing this session for Singapore. Then I've got one that's going to go out to um, Dakota after yeah. that. Now. He'll do that on keyboards and, and, and he'll do that on sax and he'll give them two or three different versions and he'll close it off. And he doesn't have to go anywhere. He said, sometimes I go to a session if they ask me, but mostly it's on it's online. Yeah. I haven't, so, I've, or, or, I haven't gone to another studio for a long time. Yeah. You don't, you don't need to. You yeah. could just record it and send that file. Last one I did was quite funny. It was, um, was for a redo version of like of the thing that had been a big, uh, dance club hit, yep. you know, they wanted some saxophone on it. And uh, so I gave them four or five different things. Yep. Right? I'm thinking, oh, they'll, they'll choose. Yep. Uh, didn't hear anything for a while. I thought, oh, maybe they didn't like it. And eventually they got back in touch with me, said, we loved it all. We've used all of them. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm, I, how can you possibly have fitted all that into into Do they the string them end to end or just put them over the top of each other? I don't know. And you play a lot of notes. I, I, I can play a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, that, so that would they, be one shit busy song. That would be a busy shit. song. So if you're out there in Clubland and you get really annoyed by an overly busy saxophone featured song, yeah. that's probably me. Yeah. Well, I'm Glenn Reuter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was, it, I didn't intend for it to come out that way. It's just that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant place to finish. Thanks, Glenn. I, I can't wait. You know, I'm out at nightclubs all the time. Yeah, so look, look, yeah. you look like a club guy. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> shirts are off, hands are in the air. <laughs> yeah. So, gentlemen, thank you so much. I know you've got early flights tomorrow. We can't thank you enough. Um, it goes without saying, let alone the incredible work you do as musicians um, on top of what you do outside of the actual night-to-night -night playing on stage. And I know you both 
do incredible work there. Can't thank you enough for your insight and it's been valuable both for the locals, like all of us, but also internationally. And for those of our international listeners, we'll be posting some links to um, each of these guys' work live. It is incredible, um, incredible stuff. So yeah, really appreciate you taking part, guys. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me back and I'm very glad that my good friend Paul was able to. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me so that they could invite, you know, I think, and if I had known we were going international, I would have got dressed up a little bit more. (laughs) I really really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, guys. No worries. And Quincy does watch this podcast, but I still think he'll want you in spite of your dress, Paul. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Well, that was a lot of fun, Paul, just as expected. Yeah, it sure was, David. And what what great guests Paul and Glenn were. And you can certainly tell they're they're great mates from from the band, but also super knowledgeable about about the industry. And what what our listeners and and viewers would have probably noticed was the rather loud and intrusive pinging that that was going on from time to time. And that was actually in relation to the fact uh, you, you heard the question about risk management in COVID times of touring and, and, uh, Paul had mentioned that they were scrambling around trying to replace a drummer for a, a show that's going on tomorrow. Well, that was that was actually Paul's tour manager pinging the band and Paul via WhatsApp, and they were just sorting out what they were going to do about a, about a sub drummer. So uh, there, there it was happening live in action as we were discussing it, Dave. Yeah, no, extremely, yeah, extremely timely. So no, that that was excellent. Can't thank them enough uh, for, for their time. It, yeah, it's, it's really, really appreciated. And for those. I did mention briefly, but our international listeners, please do check the show notes on either YouTube or on the website if you're listening to the audio version for links to some of Ice House and John Stevens' work. It is really international level stuff um, and well worth. It might be just a new discovery for you that you might enjoy. So um, first, a quick shout out to our gold and silver supporters. Um, the Core Chrome user group, so Greg and the team there um, on Facebook. So if you you are a Core Chrome user, please check them out. Um, Brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys, who um, is currently on tour. I keep up with him with the Screaming Cheetah Willies. So for those that have actually uh, listened to Brother Paul's episode, that's another band that he plays regularly with aside from the Water Boys. Uh, a big shout out to Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew. Now, Tammy, we've mentioned before, is based in Edmonton, Canada, and you will have heard in, in the interview, um, Tammy put forward a question as well for the boys. Um, uh, she was one of the first people to send us some band T-shirts for our Pimp Your T-shirt viewpoint. So for those that can see, this is the debut of the first T-shirt on the Keyboard Chronicles podcast for a band called Radioactive, and we'll link to some more information about Radioactive. So they're a Canadian band, well worth a check out. Again, we'll, we'll link to their details in the show notes. So lots more t-shirts to come. We've had a few arrive by mail. And if you still wanna take part, do drop us a message via the contact details I'm about to mention. Um, and the musicplayer.com forums too. Um, thank you for your support as always. So we'll be back again in two to three weeks, but just a reminder that you can keep in touch via a few means, www.keyboardchronicles.com, on Facebook at The Keyboard Chronicles, on Twitter at The Keyboard CHR1, and via good old fashioned email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Finally, 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 um, Patreon, we do appreciate the huge support of our Patreon um, people. Um, We've had another few people jump on board in the last couple of weeks. We hugely appreciate it. Keeps this boat afloat. Um, Really cannot thank those people enough. And um, Paul, the biggest thank you goes to you. Thanks for joining again. It was a good lot of fun. Oh, that was great. I I really enjoyed that chat. And listeners and viewers, David and I have talked about I may be doing some some other things with that, with the guys because they they were very very entertaining, a, a lot of fun, and so knowledgeable. And it's this is what this is all about. It's, it's spreading knowledge, learning from each other, and the wonderful community of listeners and keyboard players that we have. We thank you so much for tuning in to us as you do, and our numbers keep growing, and it's so exciting. It is no, absolutely. Oh, it's, it's just. It's just so good. And you raise a good point. We'd love your feedback if you haven't turned off by now because it's getting towards the end of the show. But (laughs) um, we'd actually love your feedback on whether you like these extra pieces of content. They do go initially to our Patreon supporters and then our wider audience hears them eventually. But, you know, do you like this sort of stuff? Would you like to see more? Would you like to see live streams? All that sort of stuff. We love Hmm. the feedback and, and really appreciate it. 
we're, we're open to anything, David. We'll, we, will, we will literally do anything. Oh, oh. We're, those, that kind of, we're those sort of guys. That's, that's a big call. Yes, yeah, like, I, 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 I have to tell the story about how I've had to send in photos of me only in shorts to a, a talent agency recently. That's a true there story. But that's that for another show. It. That's for another show. That, proves um, <laughs> that actually proves it. We'll do anything. So, yeah, thanks to everyone out there for listening and we'll see you back here next episode. Yeah.